Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is episode 35. Think about the last political conversation you had. Did you find yourself automatically identifying as left or right? These labels are ingrained in our political vocabulary. We use them to categorize ourselves, our friends, and even strangers. And I'm afraid that Joe Biden's been pushed too far to the left. Can he come back? We'll see. Um, And that's their vision. They want to return power to corrupt right-wing state governments. By prioritizing spending to focus on these priorities, not radical left-wing schemes like critical race theory and contentious diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, we're targeting resources to make the greatest impact for those who have worn the uniform. But here's the question. Do these labels truly reflect our beliefs? Or are they simply oversimplified boxes that force complex individuals into a linear system? In this episode, we're going to challenge the very foundation of this left versus right thinking with a guest who says that these labels don't represent consistent philosophies, but rather a broken paradigm that's actually hindering productive political discourse. My name is Hiram Lewis. I'm a professor of history at BYU-Idaho. I was previously a visiting scholar at Stanford University. I did my PhD at the University of Southern California. And my research uh, emphasizes the history of culture, particularly ideas and film. I'm happy to be here with you. Hiram Lewis is our guest today not to answer the question of left versus right, but to expose the inherent flaws in the question itself. Independent thinking leads people away from the political spectrum because it's a false model and independent minded people see through the false. <laughs> right. And it, it's it's a it's sort of a brave position to take, too, because how dare you not, you know, go along with the entire party on every issue? You know, now you're some kind of apostate or whatever. Right. Apostate, squishy. That's what people like me get called all the time. You're a squishy moderate. And again, there's nothing moderate about it. I mean, somebody who who is really, really in favor of abortion rights, but also really, really in favor of lower taxes, they're not moderate anything. They have extreme views. And yet, based on the political spectrum, since it says they're one issue, it puts them in the middle. Well, that's dumb. They're not in the middle of anything. They have two extreme views. So if we can just talk about abortion, one issue, tax cuts, another issue, then it would clarify where those people are instead of indicating the illusion they inhabit the middle of some kind of philosophy or a a competition between two worldviews. Uh, That's incorrect. So get ready to question everything you thought you knew about left and right. By the end of this episode, you might just see the political landscape in a whole new light. Yeah, so the book is The Myth of Left and Right, How the Political Spectrum Misleads and Harms America. And I I stumbled across this book. I don't even remember exactly the context, but it was, I think, just doing some general research about political polarization. And I I do like this book because it sort of has an outside-the-box look at the world, which is always kind of uh, provocative and and fun. And it frames things in a new way that I've not really seen um, you know, and I like this idea of kind of we're not giving the wrong answer, but we're asking the wrong question, which are always kind of deeper ways to look at things. And I, and I like that as well. Those are kind of my favorite kinds of conversations. So thank you for writing this book. And thanks for coming on the show. Hiram Lewis. I'm happy to be here with you, David. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And I guess before we dive into all that, I, I we should probably talk a little bit about this basic, um, the basic sort of premise or some of the language you use. And maybe it's standard stuff and I didn't know, but I hadn't really seen it before. But you talk about this, you kind of contrast what you call the essentialist theory versus the social theory. And you're sort of suggesting that there, I think I have it and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You're suggesting that there are sort of no essential characteristics binding these political positions together, but rather, you know, social ties. In other words, kind of the tribal thing. And it's not ideologies, but ideologues. It's not philosophical ties that hold together the left and right, but social conformity. And you wrote a whole book trying to explain this. So I don't know if I'm capturing it very well with my couple little sentences there. But maybe you can give us kind of an overview of this contrast as a starting point. 
Yeah. So maybe just uh, a hypothetical. So I, I want your audience to imagine that they're in the Capitol building today and they see Senator Elizabeth Warren and they approach Senator Warren with a list of a dozen or so positions that are currently popular in the Democratic Party. These would be things like raising the minimum wage, support for affirmative action, uh, belief in abortion rights, um, believing that the war in Iraq was a mistake um, and so on and so forth. And you ask Senator Warren, <clears throat> which of these positions do you agree with? She's going to say, I agree with all of them. And you say, well, Senator Warren, that's quite a coincidence. I mean, these are 12 distinct positions. Uh, you flip a coin 12 times, it doesn't come up heads every time. How is it that you just happen to agree with all 12 of them? And she'd say, well, they're not unrelated. All of these positions are progressive, and I am a progressive. And since I hold to the progressive worldview, naturally, I'm going to support those 12 policies that are expressions of my worldview. So I could, I'm picking on Senator Warren, but I could, I could pick on anybody from the Republican side. I could get any pundit from you know the major newspapers or Fox News or MSNBC and all the rest. Basically, uh, what Senator Warren, her responses express what we call the myth of left and right. She believes there, there is a, a central philosophy connecting everything that is currently popular among the political left. She thinks that there's all those issues are bound. And that's why she believes you can use a political spectrum. She, he says, I'm on one side, I believe in social justice and progress. And then there's the spectrum. And on the other side of the spectrum are people who are against social justice and progress. So if you are in favor of social justice and progress, you will believe all the positions that I hold, uh, all the positions of the Democratic Party are more progressive and all the positions of the Republican Party are less progressive. So she really believes that there is some essential characteristic. So the reason I use that anecdote is there's some people that say, you're attacking a straw man. Nobody believes in an essence behind ideology. Actually, they do. We are not attacking a straw man. Pretty much every politically active person on this in this country believes in an essence behind ideology. And that's why they use a political spectrum, because they believe that behind all of these many issues, there is really just one issue. And since one issue can be modeled on a spectrum, that's why they use a political spectrum. What we're saying is that that's completely wrong. There is no political spectrum. There is no one issue. There really are many, many issues in politics. Uh, there is abortion. That's one issue. And then there's gun control. It's a completely different issue. Is it possible and philosophically consistent to believe in more gun control and less abortion? Absolutely. There's no reason it's not. Senator Warren doesn't believe that. Uh, Sean Hannity doesn't believe that. Donald Trump doesn't believe that. They believe that if you believe in a restricting abortion, you also have to believe in gun rights. Um, but the evidence doesn't bear that out. There is no evidence at all that there's a essential issue behind all the other issues. And therefore, we are, as a society are being very silly. And that's the only way to put it because it's childish. We're being silly in using a political spectrum. Political spectrum assumes there's one issue and there's lots. So we should stop talking in terms of left and right and start talking in terms of individual issues. That would be the more rational way to proceed politically. And it would solve a lot of the problems and a lot of the outrage that you were trying to uh, get past, David. Yeah. You know, and the other piece of it is people are really attached to this idea, right? I mean, um, and you talk about a, a lot in the book too, right? I mean, I mean, you know, you, I, I, I thought of one way to, to think about it is like, you know, we, we sort of see the left and right sort of like the way we think of pornography, right? You, you can't easily define it, but you sort of know it when you see it. And it feels <laughs> like there's ideological differences there. And again, it can sort of, perhaps this is all to do with the, the you know, idea of sort of backfilling with with narr narrative stories that sort of put that position under an ideology, I guess. Um, so so maybe with that as kind of a lead in, you can kind of take that somewhere. I mean, who, the, I, I guess the question is sort of if these aren't our core beliefs or don't relate to our core beliefs, like who are we if we're not left and right or somewhere on the left right spectrum? Yeah. So you say it feels true. Um, <laughs> the four humors theory of disease felt true to doctors in the <laughs> right. 19th century. But the amount of evidence for the four humors theory of disease is exactly the same amount of evidence for the left right spectrum, namely none at all. Um, you know, so it basically we humans can create patterns where none exist. We can see signals where there's noise. Um, and that's what astrologers do. If you went into an astrologer's office, uh, David, I don't know what month you're born in, but let's say you're born in August. The astrologers say, oh, since you're born in August, you must be really brave because I know that there's a correlation between, between being born in August, you're a Leo, and being brave. Those two things go naturally together. And you said, really prove it. Well, and she'd tell you, have you tell about your life? So if you served in the military, I don't know if you did, but if you did, she'd say, obviously you're brave, served in the military. See, August brave. But what if you didn't serve in the military? She would say, David, how brave of you to oppose your country's unjust wars. Brave people uh, don't go to war because they protest just action, right? She can find a way to phrase anything as brave. And that's exactly what Senator Warren is doing. She's playing astrologer. 
you can make up a story to make everything social justice. And everything has been considered social justice. Look, if tomorrow um, immigrants started voting Republican, Democrats would become the anti-immigrant party and they would concoct a story about how it's unjust to let all these immigrants in and take jobs away from Americans and so on and so forth. They would concoct a social justice story around the opposite policies. Sometimes people called conservatives have wanted higher taxes and they made a conservation argument for higher taxes. Sometimes they wanted lower taxes and they've made a conservation argument for lower taxes. Back when Bill Clinton was in office, they said conservatives believe that character matters in public opinion. We believe in conserving biblical values. We believe in conserving traditional morality. And therefore, we're opposed to Bill Clinton and his adultery because that's that's a conservative thing. Well, then Donald Trump comes along and suddenly they say, actually, conservatives are pragmatic and they don't let things like public character in their officials and, and the private life of a president matter because pragmatism is conservatism. So we're spinning stories. So, yes, it feels like there's something there, but there's not just like it feels like there's something there for the astrologer. It felt like there was something there for the doctors in the 19th century. It's just people seeing signal where there was noise. We can look out the window at clouds and we can see pictures there. Those pictures don't exist. That is us projecting order on chaos. Yeah. And I, I, I like a lot of the examples that you do uh, mention in the book about different over his, uh, his history, how, you know, the parties have changed positions uh, on the same issues and then kind of recreate the narrative again. And that that's happened with both parties across a number of issues. Um, you know, and, but, but, you know, you could think about that. I, I could see someone who, you know, today says they're a Democrat and it's for, um, uh, you know, a sort of a philo- because of a philosophy, right? Because of some kind of essential philosophy. And then you tell them, well, the Republicans thought this way in this year. And so, well, then I would have been Republican then. I mean, do you think that's true? <laughs> How do you think that works out? <laughs> no, certainly not. We know it's not true because you can look at the data and see it. What, what, the, what the data shows overwhelmingly is that when your party changes, you change to fit the party. We like to think that we have our values. We humans are rational. We have our values. And then we, we, based on our values, choose the politicians we support. The psychology shows it's back, exactly backward. The politicians state policies and we conform. We know for a fact that they will change their views as soon as their party changes their views because they've done it before. Free trade used to be very popular among Republicans. Then Donald Trump came along and says, I'm against free trade. So Republicans turned against free trade. Democrats turned in favor of it. Switched like a, like, like a switch. It went from 80-20 on Republicans to 20-80 and vice versa. So we know for a fact that what they're saying is not true. Now, are there individuals who are philosophical and don't go along with the tribe? Sure. But those people don't agree with the Democratic or Republican Party on everything. They are dissenting. They're people like David. They're people who say, look, I think for myself and I like some things in this in this basket over here that we call Republican. I like some things in this basket called Democrat. I think for myself. But somebody like Sean Hannity or Elizabeth Warren, who agrees with everything their party believes and says it's because I'm philosophical, they are deluding themselves. So am I saying that Senator Warren is delusional? I am saying exactly that. And it's not because she's bad or stupid. She's not a bad person. She's not a stupid person. But she's she's like the doctors in the 19th century who bought into the four humors theory of disease. She has a bad paradigm. And that bad paradigm is misleading her. Sean Hannity isn't necessarily a bad or stupid person either. I don't know. I don't know the guy. But he is adhering to a false paradigm. And so he's doing a bad and stupid thing by buying into this ridiculous idea that all Republican policies are bound by a conservative philosophy. They are not. There's a whole bunch of random things the Republican Party believes currently. They are unrelated. It's as if I went to the grocery store and just grabbed a whole bunch of random products and put them into a basket. There's no relationship between them. But could I cook up a story after the fact to say, ooh, kale and Swiss cheese are actually related because they're both this and that? Of course I could concoct a story. But it would be only that. It would be an expo story. And the only thing that connects all the things that we currently call conservative are stories. They are not connected. The laboratory evidence makes this very clear. The historical evidence makes this very clear. And the survey evidence makes this very clear. Right. And, but yeah, so, and I kind of want to, so now I want to say, well, okay, so uh, this idea of, of, you know, you talk about granularity in politics is sort of, and you kind of hinted at it there, um, in terms of thinking about issues and people is perhaps the single biggest, that was a quote, sorry, quote, granularity in politics, in politics, both in terms of thinking about issues and people, is perhaps the single best way to improve political discourse, end quote. And I think that's true, but I also think it's really challenging and goes against some of our base psychology and neuroscience, because we really like to categorize things. We really like to kind of also tribe up. That's kind of what we do. And um, so tell us a little bit, like, how do you think we can get there? What are some tools we can use to get there? And then 
you know, how do we, um, you know, kind of change our thinking on this? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, one thing we can do is just be aware of it. So you said the tribal instinct is very powerful. I completely agree. And, and some people say you're being a utopian, but well, we can't get past tribalism. I'm not asking us to get tra- past tribalism. We can't. Look, I'm a, I'm a New York Jets fan. There's nothing you could say or do to get me to stop cheering for the Jets. I, I mean, look, they haven't been in the playoffs for 12 years. And I'm still cheering for them, for crying out loud. So if that's not going to you know, wean me off the Jets, nothing is. <laughs> I, I'm tribal. I can't stop myself. Uh, so we're not saying stop being tribal. Human beings have to change their psychology and we can magically you know, take the tribal microchip out of our brains and throw it away. That is not possible. But what we can do is be aware of the tribalism. I'm cheering for Aaron Rodgers now. I'm cheering for Aaron Rodgers. Why? <laughs> now, it's because he belongs to my tribe. He just got picked up by the Jets, so I'm cheering for him. I didn't cheer him for him last year. I haven't cheered for him the past 15 years. He's been with the Packers. But I'm cheering for him now because he joined my tribe. So what am I doing? I'm being tribal, and I admit it. What would be foolish of me to do, though, is to say, actually, uh, Aaron Rodgers uh, adheres to my philosophy because all true Jets adhere to um, the philosophy of pragmatism, and, and he's a pragmatic. You know, that would be silly. But that's what we're doing in politics. When our tribes, when our political tribes switch their issues, which they're constantly doing, we concoct ludicrous stories to try to convince ourselves we're not being tribal, we're being philosophical. So just admit the tribalism. I want Elizabeth Warren to say, when somebody brings her that list of policies and says, Elizabeth Warren, why do you agree with all these 12 policies for her to say, because I am a conformist, because I'm just going along with the team. That's the truth. So the first thing we want us to do as a society is to admit that these that these ideologies are, are connected by tribe, nothing else, that there is no essence behind them. And if you say, hey, I believe what I believe because my tribe believes it, that is a huge step forward to making our, our discourse more civil. Second thing we would say you can do is uh, to start changing our speech. So you mentioned this is very hard. I, I completely agree because we have a bad paradigm overarching everything. And so bad vocabulary flows out of a bad paradigm. The same way that it was really hard for doctors in the 19th century to stop talking about sanguines and melancholics and cholerics and all these kinds of categories associated with the four humorous theory, because that four humorous theory was what they were taught in medical school. It was overarching everything they did. For hundreds of years, doctors had been bloodletting their patients and purging their patients of, of, of stomach fluids and so forth to try to restore balance. And so the, the vocabulary was embedded in the medical practice. So it's very hard to wean themselves off of. So I have no illusions. This is very hard. So when we say things like center left and so forth, yeah, because we're stuck in a bad paradigm. It's as if we're talking about a a sanguine or a melancholic in the 19th century in medicine. But doctors had to get rid of that vocabulary. They had to because it sprung from a bad paradigm. And they were killing more patients than they saved until they got rid of the bad paradigm. So So how can we talk instead? The best thing we can do is do exactly what doctors did. Instead of pretending there was four categories of people, just talk about individual illnesses. Instead of saying, ooh, he's sanguine and has too much blood. No, say he has a strep throat. He has a staph infection. Uh, he has a broken fractured tibia. Uh, he's got lung cancer, right? Just go granular and talk about exactly what you have. Don't say center left. Say who, what? Do you mean by center left, they're in favor of free trade? Do you mean they're um, in favor of abortion rights? Uh, do you mean they're in favor of higher income taxes on the rich? Just say what it is. Center left implies that there's this whole package of positions called left wing, and they agree mildly with all those positions. And and one, that's not true. And two, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we're advocating, yes, starting to change our language in a more granular way. So those are kind of the, the two best things we can do to uh, to overcome this terrible paradigm that has captured politics and is turning us against each other because it does make us hostile. I mean, look, if, if Elizabeth Warren confronted the reality that her party is just a basket of random positions, she would be far more charitable to those who disagreed with position. But currently, if you disagree with her on even one part of one position, then that makes you, quote, right wing and therefore against social justice and therefore a fascist and therefore all these bad things. If, on the other hand, you admitted that, hey, there is no essential issue and there is no right and left, there's just a bunch of policies that my party already have to support, some of them good, some of them bad, then would we be able to talk constructively because we're not dealing with enemies, we're dealing with issues. It's not about who, it's about what. And working through those issues empirically would be much easier. But currently, we've bundled them together under this illusion that they're all connected. And therefore, righteous people have this bundle, and wicked people have that bundle. That's why Elizabeth Warren is so hostile. That's why Donald Trump is so hostile. That's why Sean Hannity is so hostile, because they are beset by this delusion. Wake up from the delusion. It will make you smarter. It'll make you better. It will make you more civil. It'll help you come to the place that David David wants us to come. True. 
Uh, yeah, for sure. And the thing that I wonder, though, is it seems like the parties kind of uh, take advantage of this, right? I mean, this is yes. what they want to have. They want it to be like Absolutely. this. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I-, I couldn't agree more. I think that's one of the main reasons it's persist. It, it persists, one, because it's it's simple, right? We like simple models. The complexity of medicine that there's all these different diseases and viruses and bacteria and the, uh, this here and an abrasion here. And, uh, you know, that's complicated. So the doctor said, la, 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 I don't want to hear complication. No, no, no. There's only four body types and only four humors. We just have to get a little balance. Simple appeals. I get it. Okay. But simple has to be true. And this simple paradigm isn't true. So that's one reason is the simplicity. But there's institutional incentives, as you mentioned, David, because the parties get more power and more support by perpetuating the illusion. So if I get a letter from the Democratic Party and it says, Hiram, you have to support the Democratic Party. The forces of right-wing fascism are growing in this country. Please support progressivism, the righteous philosophy. And our party stands for progressivism. And if progressivism doesn't win, the forces of reaction and right-wing will take us and will, our country will become fascist and Hitler. I'm much more likely to support when somebody sends me a letter like that. If the Democratic Party sent me a letter that said, Hiram, um, we're the Democrats. We stand for a whole bunch of positions, some good, some bad. Please donate. I'm not going to donate. That's not going to you know, create this sense of urgency and craze, and it's not going to cre- create this sense of, uh, of threat. It's not going to elevate and turn on the lizard brain. So the political spectrum is a lizard brain primitive model, but, we, but, but parties like those primitive models because it fires up those primitive parts of the brain that get you very angry, the amygdala, the emotions, instead of the higher brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is rational, system two, deliberative, evidence-based. They don't like that. Because once you're evidence-based, you don't support parties all in. You, you, you'll see, if you're being evidence-based, that the Democratic Party supports some good things, some bad things. If you're evidence-based, you'll see the Republican Party supports some good things, some bad things. Evidence-based will make you much more distant from both parties. But the illusion that there's only one issue and that everything the Democrats believe is righteous because it's all social justice, that activates the amygdala. It gets you angry at the people on the other side. And you're much more likely to open your pocketbook. You're much more likely to go to a rally and scream and yell and do all the things that these parties need you to do for support. Anyway, sorry for that digression, but please go on. No, that's basically pretty much what I was going to talk about, too, because, you know, we also find it, you know, it becomes a morality piece as well, right? You know, I've heard you use the tribe left, tribe right sort of language as sort of adding that qualifier to it. And, you know, I think that's significant. I mean, it, it, you, you, you know, I guess someone could argue it's kind of like a distinction without a difference, but I don't think that's true. I think adding that little qualifier, because like if, it, you know, if I'm talking about someone who declares themselves left or right, I might use the term in that sense, right? Like this person thinks of themselves as lean left. If I, I can sort of add that tribe left, tribe right to it, I think that does make a difference. Well, I completely agree. The tendency we have under the myth of left and right is to add ideological prefixes to tribal terms. So, for instance, um, you'll hear people say he's a right wing anti abortion activist. Okay. So, what possible motive could they have to add the words right wing to anti abortion? Why would they add that? The only reason, the only reason, because it doesn't add any information. Anti abortion activist tells you what you need to know. This person is opposed to abortion. So, why would you say right wing? Because that motivates your tribe to say we need to hate that person because they're on the right, wrong side of the spectrum. So it's all in an attempt. Those prefixes that we constantly attach to substantive terms are there only to gin up tribal hatred. We need to get rid of those. Instead of saying right-wing anti-abortion activists, just say anti-abortion. Eliminate that. Okay. So instead of adding, adding these ideological prefixes to substantive terms, we propose adding substantive prefixes to tribal terms. So instead of saying left and right, Say tribe left and tribe right, because that will help puncture the illusion. If I currently say left wing, right wing people, oh, a spectrum, and he's somewhere he believes in a little bit of change and a lot of change. You center right, he's slightly believes in conserving. Center left, slightly believe in in social justice. Right? They, they suddenly go into the myth of left and right, and they start thinking in that false paradigm. But if you say tribe left and tribe right, it communicates the reality that what we call left wing is nothing other than a tribe. And all of these positions called left wing are not connected. They are only connected by a tribe and people who adhere to all those positions are just doing so for social conformity. That communicates the truth. And the more we speak in those terms, slowly but steadily, it will start to see help people see the reality that what we call left and right are tribal, not philosophical. Puncturing the myth of left and right would be a huge advance for us. So that's yeah, if it, you know it's it's almost inevitable to use these terms because like you say, they're everywhere in our culture. So how do we wean ourselves off of them? 
I would just say add the word tribe before the terms to, to kind of preface with, here's what I mean when I use the word left. I'm not talking about a philosophy. I'm not talking about a spectrum. I'm talking about a tribe. Elizabeth Warren is tribe left. Great. If you say she's on the left or she's a progressive, well, now suddenly, ooh, she adheres to a philosophy. And that's, no, 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 that's all wrong. Tribe left, that's all right. Hmm. I, I like it. I think I'm going to start using that more. <laughs> well, I hope so. It's very hard to do. You know, I was the author of the book. My brother and I, we still have to catch ourselves all the time. Yeah. And, I, you know, basically, um, I, I really think, like, if we can do this, this, like you say, is going to be such a step because half of this outrage is result of us being outraged at the other side, the wrong, you know, the wrong tribe. And, and um, so if we can start thinking in different ways, we can still maybe have things to be outraged about, but maybe we can start uh, focusing that outrage on our specific issues we're concerned about. Oh, sure. I mean, look, as a Jets fan, you know, I don't like Patriots fan, uh, but it's more playful, right? They're a different tribe. But do I think they're all evil people because they adhere to an evil philosophy? No, because I don't have a myth of left and right saying, ooh, all Jets are good people and all Patriots are bad people. And Aaron Rodgers suddenly became a good person when he moved to the Jets. We don't have that illusion, but we do have that illusion of politics. And that's why there's so much hatred. So yeah, Patriots fans and Jets fans, you know, they have tribal animosity. That's inevitable, but it's not going to get personal and you're not going to want to kill anybody or want to silence them or something like that. It's going to be a little more playful and good natured. And so, so making us more cognizant of the tribal nature of our uh, political commitments will help to diffuse the bombs that you're talking about. Well, and maybe we can start identifying in a shared tribe, like as Americans, maybe. <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. And there are good tribes. That's a great point. So the tribes, you know, political tribes are bad. We need to find healthier tribes. Absolutely. So some people think, well, America is not a good tribe, nationalism and so forth, but there is a healthy patriotism, right? I think there is a possibility of identifying as Americans and identifying our commonality. But there's other tribes too that are healthy. Look, if somebody belongs to a service organization, say you belong to the Red Cross and volunteer and give blood and I don't know, a soup kitchen or something, would that be a tribe? You better believe it, but it's a good tribe. There's so many benefits to certain tribes. So religious tribes, tribes, yes. Sports tribes, sure. Um, service tribes, family tribes. Absolutely. I'm not against tribalism. I'm against bad tribalism. And our political tribalism is really bad because we have deluded ourselves that it's not tribalism. We have deluded ourselves that we're philosophical, that we are fighting for progressivism or conserving the principles of this or that. Get rid of the delusion, call it for it as a tribe, and that'll help us to diffuse those tribes and move into healthier tribes. Awesome. Well, uh, I really appreciate the conversation and uh, those insights. I, I really appreciate you making the time, Hiram Lewis, for the podcast. It's been my pleasure, David. Thank you. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. I want to take a moment to thank those that have contributed to the show. Your support helps us cover costs to continue to improve the show and is greatly appreciated. For as little as $3 a month, you can become a subscriber to get access to exclusive subscriber-only content, sneak peeks into what's coming, behind-the-scenes exclusive content, and you can learn about upcoming guests in advance and even submit questions for the interview. Visit outrageoverload.net slash contribute. Okay, see you in a few weeks.